So pardon. Part three, keep my commands and follow them. Chapter 21 is pre-ceremonial cleanliness. First the priests, verses 1 to 9. So as a mediator between God and the people, it was of dire importance that the priest kept holy as God is holy. To do so, a priest was not to attend the funeral of a non-family member, shave his head, or marry a prostitute, or a divorcee. This required self-denial on the part of the priest and special reverence for priests by the rest of the community. God has called us to live a holy life as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We are priests in the sense that we are to learn and teach God's words to the world and also pray on behalf of the world. Keeping holy is difficult and requires self-denial against trends of the world, even of seemingly good things, like attending a funeral. But God wants us to deeply know the blessing of sharing in his holiness as his priest, because we have the honor of serving him. When we pursue the holiness of God in acknowledgement of his saving grace, it is he who makes us holy with his great power and love. The High Priest, verses 10 to 15. The High Priest was specially set apart from other priests, having the anointing oil poured over his head, and being ordained to wear the priestly garments. Further rules apply to him. He was not to enter a funeral home, even for his own father or mother. He also had to carefully follow God's rule in choosing a wife. Due to the importance of the high priest's role, he had to struggle against even the slightest bit of secularism. Also, anyone with a defect was not allowed to participate in the priestly duty, even if he was a descendant of Aaron. The prohibition against defects is not a law of discrimination, but rather emphasizes the holiness of God. As a royal priesthood who serves God in this generation, we also must clothe ourselves with the holy garments of Christ Jesus. So even St. Augustine, a very carnal man, became a new creation and walked in the way of God after accepting this word. Uh, Grace Beck. Yes, can you read? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, can you read this? Yeah. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Amen. Not done. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Yeah. Let's actually read that last sentence together. Okay, one, two, three. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Chapter 22 on sacred offerings. Uh, here, sacred offerings were a portion of the sacrifices that were offered to the Lord reserved for the priest and his family to eat. The commands regarding priest cleanliness... Oh. Okay. The commands regarding priest cleanliness reveal God's standard of holiness. So when you read um, verse 1 to 9, I didn't include it, but it seems like impossible to keep. Um, and it is. Only Christ himself, the great high priest, can reach this standard of holiness. But this Christ reigns in us. And he also calls us, so he enables us to be holy. Verses 10 to 16 talk about who can eat sacred offerings. So sacred offerings were not to be eaten by just anybody, but only a priest and his family. This required that not only the priest see himself as holy, but the whole community, to humbly acknowledge the distinction. 
It required that the people treat him with love, trust, respect, and honor out of the same for God. It is nonsense to think that we can honor the invisible and holy God without first honoring a visible servant of God. Okay, how offerings were to be presented, verses 17 to 30. So they were, they were to be holy without defects. Burnt offerings could be presented to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering. The offering had to be presented with prayer from a willing and thankful heart. Without that prayerful heart, the offering had no meaning. This has to be our attitude of wor uh, in worship as well as the attitude of our life. So worship is not just about Sunday services. Of course, keeping the Sabbath is absolutely important to God and should be set apart as a day we specially prepare and present our devotion to Him. But worship to God is daily, too. Our daily life must be a life of a burnt offering, offering ourselves fully to God. So let's read these verses together. Uh, one, two, three. Keep my commands and follow them. I am the Lord. Do not profane my holy name. I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who makes you holy and who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. So our God wants to be acknowledged as holy by his people. This is God's very purpose in creating man, saving Israel by his grace and raising them to be a holy nation set apart from the world. When we keep and follow God's commands, the name of God is glorified as holy. The core message of part three. So in this section we learn that especially priests as spiritual leaders have to keep themselves holy and pure to serve God. As Israel was saved by God's grace, so we also were saved by grace, and we hope to be priests in this generation. The Bible gives us a clear and practical guideline on how we are to bear this grace and live according to God's holy standard. Thinking of Jesus who went before us as our great high priest, we can offer ourselves fully to the Lord as his priests and shepherds for our generation. Okay, it's part four. Rewards, punishment, and vows, chapters 26 and 27. So chapter 26 uh, records the reward for obedience and the punishment for dis disobedience. Okay, let's read these verses together. Um, verses one and two. Okay, one, two, three. Do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves, and do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. Observe my Sabbath and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. So here God warns against the sin of idolatry. Again, it is most emphasized because it is the easiest sin to commit. Failing to acknowledge God as the Lord is the root of all other sins. Idol worshiping brings God's curse, but ridding oneself of idols, which is repentance, brings blessing. We see that in the life. We see that in the life of Abraham, who became a source of blessing for the whole world because he left his idol worshiping country. Verses. Um, 3 to 13 reveal that God is so willing to bless his people with material blessings if they follow his decrees. So that includes bountiful crops, protection from enemies, and making them increase in number. But the greatest reward is the presence of God with his people. So let's read these verses together, verses 11 to 13. Okay, one, two, three. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. God also said to Abraham, I am your shield, your very great reward in Genesis 15.1. And it was for this reward that Moses forsook all the treasures of Egypt in um, Hebrews 11:26. 26. 
In Jesus Christ, we can have this presence of God right here and right now. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. Mark 1.15 where there's repentance, the Holy Spirit comes and the kingdom of God grows in and through that person. This blessing has reached us all because of Jesus. In him, God has broken the bars of our yoke and enabled us to walk with our heads held high as more than conquerors. This is great news. But what would happen if they did not obey God? So verses 4 to 17, these verses reveal that if, look, that if they would not obey, God would bring sudden terror, sickness, and defeat in battle. Even though God is the God of love and salvation, his judgment remains when one refuses to repent. God always gives us the choice to repent and turn to him. He gave this chance to Adam, Cain, Cain and even Pharaoh. His heart is that... None may perish, but all might come to repentance. But his mercy has a limit. God judges. We saw, we see it, we saw it in Noah's flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, the ten plagues on Egypt, and in Revelation. Judgment before Jesus comes again as king, and ultimately eternal judgment in hell. Here, as in Exodus, God warns his judgment in stages. So... So there is a stage that I didn't put that includes wasting diseases that would destroy the people and weaken their survivors, planting seeds in vain because of their enemies, their enemies would eat it, and being defeated by their enemies who would rule over them and from whom they would flee in fear and misery if they did not repent even still. Uh, the second stage of judgment would be more severe. God would break down their stubborn pride and the trees of the land would not yield their fruit. If they would still not repent, um, wild animals would attack the people so that their population would decrease. And if they would still not repent, God himself would be hostile towards them, afflict them for their sins seven times over, the land would vomit, and the land would vomit them out, and they would waste away. So this says a lot about Israel that they didn't repent more than five times opportunities they were given because the land vomited them out. As a result, um, they fell into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And because, during, uh, because they had not kept the Sabbath nor the year of Jubilee, God let the land enjoy compensated rest for the 70 years that they were captives in Babylon. So he completely fulfilled his word. Um, second, that's Second Chronicles 36, 20 to 21. So if the people repeatedly refuse to listen to God and remain hostile toward, towards him, eventually they would be completely destroyed and live in a constant state of terror. There would be no rest in their souls. Um, as we examine the Bible, we can see how stubbornly Israel resisted God. Uh, in Acts, Steph Stephen rebuked them for their wickedness. Um, Paul Choi, can you read this, these verses? Uh, you stiff like people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect uh, through angels, but have not obeyed it. <laughs> so not only Stephen, but all the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi rebuked Israel for their hypocrisy and disobedience. And they were killed for it. So you can really see persistence of man's sin, pride, and rebellion against God. But despite all of this, what does God, in his great mercy, promise? This is verses 40 to 46. So let's read just what's on the slide together. 
Okay, one, two, three. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their fathers, then when their uncircumcised hearts are humble and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. I am so even though God resisted, uh, Israel resisted God, was destroyed and taken captive to the lands of their enemies as slaves, God always remembered them, redeemed them, and carried out his work of, self of redemption and salvation. This God is the God of persistent holy love. This is the love of the Father God who welcomed and served the prodigal son who returned home in Luke 15. Um, although people stubbornly walk in the way of judgment, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, and shed his blood on the cross to the point of death in order to save. Indeed, God is holy and he is love. So let us confess our sin and return to the Father that we might dwell with him and live. Finally, chapter 27. This is the last chapter of Leviticus and it teaches about um, how keep how we should keep vows. So, so what is a vow? Who knows what a vow is? Honest. Honest. Promise. promise. Okay. Yes, it's a promise to God. So, what are some examples of vows in the Bible? Hannah, what? Yeah, so Hannah vowed to give Samuel because she was barren, and then God gave her a son. So she gave, dedicated Samuel to God. Another, Jacob, what did Jacob vow? Offer tithes, right? If God helped him in that moment, yeah. So, so, um, from this chapter, we see that God takes vows very seriously, so be careful what you vow. Um, don't take it lightly. Um, so there are five kinds of vows outlined in this chapter. Um, so first, a vow to dedicate persons, a vow to offer an animal, a vow to dedicate a house, a vow to dedicate land, and a perfect vow. So first, a vow to dedicate persons. Here's um, a chart I summarized, uh, one to eight. So it's a little weird because it's like putting people on a market, but you'll see the most valuable is uh, age, age 20 to 60 males, so they're 50 shekels of silver to, to vow to dedicate. And the least valuable, were one month and five years female. So I guess the idea is like they can serve more if they're 20 to 60 male. Um, but I don't think we should read too much into it. And then uh, a vow to offer an animal, this is 913. So when one vowed an animal, it was very tempting to save the better animal for yourself and give the inferior one to God, thinking, oh, only I know, you know, and I'm doing God a favor, or, you know. But that is why uh, there was a clear standard for what is acceptable as a, as a vow. Um, and if that person vowed something that was not acceptable, he had to add a fifth to the value that the priest said in the case that he wanted to redeem it, so get it back. And that added one-fifth applied to dedicating a house as well. So dedicating land is a little bit different. Um, its value was determined according to the number of years remaining until the next year of Jubilee, since they only had the right to use the land and not to own it. In the year of Jubilee, the right of all ownership was restored to the original owner. And finally, a perfect vow. 
So who knows what is a, what a perfect foul is? Okay, it's right there. But we can read these verses together. I have this verse together. So one, two, three. A sight of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So, since God owned a tenth of everything, the people were to offer a tenth of all they had to God. So from this, we know that a perfect vow is to dedicate what is God's to God. It's just, it's his by default. So you just, you give it. It's, that's a perfect vow. But the fact is that everything is God's. Um, so I studied law, and in property law, the concept of possession is distinct from the concept of ownership. Um, possession is relatively easy to prove. You just have to show a manifest intent to control something. That, like, okay, I'm, I'm holding this, and it's, I'm holding it strongly, and so I'm controlling it, and I'm showing you. So that means I'm possessing it right now. Um, Ownership is, is hard to prove. The reason why it's hard to prove is, is because it doesn't really exist. Because you can only be an owner if you created that thing. So in our day, farmers are considered owners because they rear their own crops and livestock into being. And I guess parents are considered owners of their children. But no person like fundamentally ever created a thing, not even farmers and parents. So um, none of us, in the true sense of the word, are owners except God. Um, so when I read Genesis uh, and learn that God is creator, for me it's synonymous to owner. Um, so what he has done is he has merely entrusted to our possession the things he has given us. So think about this love of God through uh, the parable of the tenants in Mark 12. Um, so in that parable, God rented out his vineyard, uh, this world, to us, his tenants. But we rejected his ownership by killing his prophets. At this, God should have judged the world because it rejected his ownership. And yet he gave one more, the best thing, his only son. In Christ, God gave us truly everything. In light of this lavish love of God, how should we live then? So if you get $100 this week, should you, cut, or like $110 this week, should you give exactly $11 on the day? So in Paul, in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Paul says, actually, Anna, so can you read this? Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not in some house, or under conscription. For God loves a cheerful man. Mm -hmm. So in Matthew 19, Jesus said to a rich young man who boasted of having kept all the laws, he said, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, then come follow me. Then a man went away sad, because he loved his possessions more than he loved Jesus. On the contrary, Jesus commended the offering of a poor widow, who, though she offered only two small copper coins, had given all she had to live on. Jesus also praised the woman, who broke her alabaster jar and poured out the perfume it contained on Jesus' head. These women gave their all, their very best to the Lord. They could do so because they knew the holy love of God. So Romans 12.1 can be a good application of Leviticus as a whole. So let's read this verse together. One, two, three. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So we have come here to GLEF 2019, sacrificing a lot of time and money. And, I don't know, maybe you're sitting here 
after four days thinking, why did I come here? Um, I didn't sign up for this. But truly, 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 it is only by God's grace Amen. that we can be here and be, um, enjoy fellowship with God and with one another in God. As we learned, it cost the life of the Son of God and so many martyrs of faith for us to hear the word of God. Um, I want to turn to one example of a martyr, a um, great missionary, David Livingston. He was a European missionary to Africa in the 19th century, and he suffered a lot in the mission field. And this was his testimony, so I'll just read it. So people talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward in healthy activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious, of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with the word in such a view and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with the foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. So likewise may we all be filled with the grace of God until we see our sacrifice to him as a privilege. So 30, uh, verse 34 is the conclusion of this passage as well as the whole book of Leviticus. So let's read this verse together. One, two, three. Yes. These are the commands the Lord gave Moses on Mount Sinai for the Israelites. So the laws are God's commands for the Israelites that the Lord gave Moses on Mount Sinai. As we saw in this last chapter, the conclusion of Leviticus is total worship. Worship is the result of one made holy, the ultimate expression of love, and it fulfills the whole law of God. Let's read the key verses one more time. So, first Leviticus 19, 2. Okay, one, two, three. Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Leviticus 22, 31. One, two, three. Keep my commands and follow them. I am the Lord. So in light of his saving grace and with hope of the glorious kingdom, let's live our lives fully devoted to God as his priests by keeping God's commands. To do this, we must keep the holy love of God in our hearts burning always. So let's recognize the blessing of being called his holy people and so love him with this same love, with all our hearts, and love our neighbors as ourselves, in obedience to him who first loved us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for uh, blessing our Leviticus study. Uh, thank you for uh, revealing yourself and your holy love to us through your laws. Father, uh, truly uh, you care for each one and you desire none to perish, but all to uh, come into fellowship with you as your holy people. Help us, Father, not to take this grace lightly, but uh, to cherish it by struggling to obey you every day. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, Jesus' cross, and renew his grace, repent every day, uh, that we can confess we never made a sacrifice. Amen. Father, uh, please uh, also be uh, among us that we can encourage one another to grow as your holy people in our generation. Uh, make us your holy people, Lord. Thank you for this time of prayer, and I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.